side of the Recovery Act is not enough to meet the broadband gap that we have in the country, to really address the deployment issues, the adoption issues, the digital literacy issues that we have. Uh, and so in the Recovery Act, Congress also tasked the FCC with developing a national broadband plan. Should have done it years ago. But Congress did it, the President signed it, and the FCC worked very hard to develop a national broadband plan that we released just a few months ago in March. It's an ambitious strategy to promote U.S. leadership and ensure that every American can enjoy the benefits of broadband. The plan lays out goals for the country, goals around uh, pursuing one, one gigabit anchor institution that's publicly available in every community in the country, 100 megabits to 100 million households by 2020, taking our adoption rate from 65%, 66%, to 90% in the next 10 years, which, by the way, would be a faster curve than we have for telephone service in the country. Some people thought uh, these goals were just way too ambitious. Um, but I think they're goals that we need to work to hit. Now, the plan has a series of concrete recommendations on infrastructure deployment, adoption, the development of a whole series of innovative solutions to national challenges. Uh, let me touch on a few of them here. We'll probably come back to others during our session. Uh, let me start with something that uh, we all know is increasingly important to our mobile ecosystem, uh, and that is mobile broadband. You know, the, uh, the farmer who cares about broadband, well, they want broadband um, uh, when they're at a desk. Uh, but they also want to need broadband when they're on tractor and field. Uh, we have the opportunity to lead the world in um, uh, mobile broadband innovation. We have to tackle um, the spectrum crunch that's coming. And the broadband plan uh, proposes recovering 500 megahertz of spectrum over the next 10 years. Uh, it's important that we tackle these spectrum issues so that we lead the world in mobile broadband innovation. The plan has a series of recommendations around lowering the cost of broadband deployment to incentivize deeper, faster broadband build-out. And so at the FCC, we moved on one of them already, a tower siting uh, proposal that will speed up the ability uh, to site towers. Uh, the plan recommends, and we weren't shy about borrowing uh, good ideas, but the plan recommends that we move forward on the idea that Senator Klobuchar has introduced in Congress dig once. If we're digging up a road anywhere in the country, in a world where we know that some of the biggest costs employing broadband is um, the build-out itself, we've got to lay the conduits, we've got to lay the fiber at the same time. Now, to make sure all Americans can afford can access affordable high-speed internet. One of the most significant recommendations in the plan is to transform what's called our Universal Service Fund from supporting the telephone service to broadband. Uh, so this is something that may be uh, um, uh, not that familiar to people who are growing increasingly interested in broadband, but we have a program in the United States. It's called the Universal Service Fund. It's about $8 billion a year. And it's done a very good job over the years helping universalize telephone service. Well, we've got to transform that to support broadband service. It's complex, it's not easy, uh, but we have to do it to make sure that broadband reaches rural America and that the other parts of USF are all transformed to apply to broadband. To ensure that all Americans have access to 21st century healthcare, the National Broadband Plan recommends, and we have started to move on transforming what had been a pilot program to connect rural hospitals, clinics, family doctors to broadband. Uh, as many as one third of rural healthcare clinics don't have access to broadband. And so to get the benefits of broadband and healthcare, they, they just can't do it. We need to tackle it. Uh, 
Uh, and so much is at stake here when you think about it, and some of you may be here from rural parts of the country. Um, I was in uh, uh, Oakland, California a couple of weeks ago, and I saw um, uh, a pretty vivid example of what this can mean. Uh, at the Children's Hospital in Oakland, um, they have specialists, including pediatric cardiologist specialists who, um, well, they're specialists, they have the skills specialists have. Uh, and we participated in the demonstration where there were parents in a rural California town and a newborn who had heart issues and was in a hospital where um, that cardiac, where they didn't have the kind of cardiac specialist who could treat this infant. Now we can imagine the parents driving the infant back and forth, back and forth for three or four hours. Or we can imagine a world where we saw what I saw, which is they took the echocardiogram and the ultrasound of the baby's heart in the rural town. And the specialist in Oakland was able to read it on the screen and provide the kind of um, uh, uh, medical assistance that you would want. Uh, I've seen this with uh, uh, infants. There's a disease that causes blindness in newborns that's treatable. Uh, if doctors who are the specialists have to travel around as they do now, to lots of different hospitals, there's just a limit to how many infants they can see, diagnose, and treat. Well, with broadband, and I've seen a demonstration of this, um, the doctor can stay back in his or her hospital, and with broadband and the right um, devices, they can diagnose the infant remotely. Uh, I've seen places where um, uh, cancer patients, chemotherapy patients, instead of having to travel back and forth over a six month period where they might need 12 chemotherapy treatments, uh, back and forth three or four hours, 12 times. Um, I saw one hospital where they they started to have the patient travel just once at the beginning, once at the end, and the chemotherapy is administered remotely uh, in between with a local med medical technician and a remote uh, a cancer specialist providing guidance through all that. You look at these things, and I suspect that you think what I think, which is these examples, which are now the exception, should be the rule in the United States. And that's what we're trying to achieve with our broadband plan. Uh, education, I'll mention that briefly. The FCC has, uh, in one area over the years, developed a plan to harness some of the opportunities of the internet, and that has to do with education. It's a program called the E-Ray Program, which has done a good job over the last number of years, uh, thanks to the work of Senator Rockefeller and Senator Snow, uh, Congressman Markey, and others who've been pushing this for a long time uh, in connecting schools to the internet. So interestingly, while um, rural healthcare clinics, where there hasn't been the focus, uh, are at, and, uh, and even the data here isn't very good, but say 67% penetration, Schools are actually way above 90% in internet connectivity. But there are a series of reforms we need to put in place to make sure that the E-Ray program is working for the 21st century. Uh, making sure that it works for communities, that it supports faster speeds, that it uh, supports various different technologies. Uh, finally, public safety. The opportunities of broadband to support our national goal recommended by the 9-11 Commission of making sure that we have a, an interoperable national mobile broadband network for our first responders is critical. This is one where it's not going to get built by itself. Uh, we do need Congress to step up and to say this is an area where we need to make an investment and we need to do it soon because if we can build out the mobile broadband public safety network while commercial providers are building out 4G, the next generation of wireless, we can have significant cost savings. We can save lives and save money for uh, the American people if we move on this 